be just the same as we've heard before. Diana was the very essence of compassion, of duty, of style, of beauty, a standard bearer for the rights of the truly downtrodden, and who proved in the last year that she needed no royal title to continue to generate her particular brand of magic. It sounded to me like a speech where nobody had advised him, no, nobody had drafted it for him. It was not, you know, the formal speech on the formal occasion. It came straight from his heart. She talked endlessly of getting away from England, mainly because of the treatment that she received at the hands of the newspapers. She would want us today to pledge ourselves to protecting her beloved boys, William and Harry, from a similar fate. And I do this here, Diana, on your behalf. And beyond that, on behalf of your mother and sisters, I pledge that we, your blood family, will do all we can to continue the imaginative and loving way in which you are steering these two exceptional young men, so that their souls are not simply immersed by duty and tradition, but can sing openly as you planned. He basically looked over, you know, to a, a pew full of um, his in-laws um, and had a go at them from the box in the middle of a funeral of his sister. Well, you know, uh, questionable. He was saying that they hadn't, hadn't looked after her and they were inappropriate to bring up her children. It was very strong stuff. I think the emotional impact of his speech was so great that we just sat and took it in. And then the sound came. I didn't realize it was people clapping outside. It sounded like pebbles rattling on the roof of the abbey. And it was coming closer and closer. It was quite put up the hairs on the back of your neck. Welcome to Majesty's Sussex Report. I'm Antonio, and it's an absolute pleasure to have you here with us. Welcome, welcome, welcome. To our subscribers, don't forget to put your notification on if you have it off, because then you know when we upload um, any new episode, you will be first ones to know, okay? If you're just discovering the channel, welcome. And do give us a chance. Uh, check out our content if you do like it. Do subscribe. It helps the channel out. Give a thumbs up to like the content or like the channel or this episode. And also do leave us a comment. We do like to hear from all of you. However, your comments will not be published if they are negative or rude or condescending or uh, nasty or ill-informed or anything like that. Listen, this is a channel that supports the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. If you don't like them, you're entitled to your opinion, your thoughts, and all of that. Keep them to yourself. We don't need to hear them. You don't need to share them here. So no need to, okay? Thank you anyways for checking the channel out. And boy, oh boy, oh boy, do we have a lot to cover today. Well, Prince Harry surprised everyone over in London because he showed up a day earlier than they expected. He showed up for a panel and, <laughs> of course, there's no leaks in Montecito, so no one knew except the people who needed to know. So he showed up, he did his thing in the panel, then St. Paul's Cathedral was just an awesome, awesome event. Um it's amazing the amount of people that showed up, right? And so we'll be talking about all of that. I will not be um, 
touching a lot on all the different media and how they cover the story. What I will do is just select maybe one or two. And what I want us to pay close attention to, because the way they cover it, right, in the convention, con, uh, um, conventional media um, is, is, is quite similar. So all of the UK um, press covered it similar. They told the story in a similar way. And what I want us to pay attention to really is how the story is being told. Because the job of a journalist, of a reporter, is to report the story. But, you know, the, 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 the sort of second, second headline or title is the emotion. With every story, the reporter or the journalist, with purpose, wants to send a message, right? Wants to create a certain emotion. So what we should be paying attention to is how do they start the story? What's the headline, right? What's the middle part of the story? And what's the end of the story? How do they wrap it up? And how does it leave us feeling? That's very important, right? Because they transmit a certain message through the words that they use, how they use it, where it's placed, the intonation, and what they leave in the story and what they do not tell you as part of the story. So we'll look at it on that sort of, um, that sort of uh, viewpoint because they all sort of cover it the same, as I said before. And it's fascinating to me, fascinating how, you know, Megan gets into this story of how they've, they've covered it. And also <laughs> the whole thing about the, the, the king being way too busy to see his son, which fascinates me also. So I purposefully um, started as part of our intro, the Earl Spencer um, eulogy or speech at Diana's funeral. And I've watched that funeral um, in documentaries and stuff that, that, that they've, they've done on Diana's life. And I've listened to that speech several times. And in years past, I've always sort of wondered if the Earl Spencer kept his word. Because as one, you know, look into the, 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 the lives of, of, of the royals, it just seemed very much so that the Earl Spencer was sort of not, not invited. <laughs> like he wasn't really part of their lives, of, of Prince Harry and um, Prince William, uh, that the, 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 the firm you know, had 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 more of a say, had had more of of the control, and I I wasn't sure how much influence um, he he had, if he had kept his word to his sister. So it's fascinating though that now, I mean, the Spencers, the Spencers are showing up for real, 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 and. And it's great to see because I'm loving me some Spencer. Okay, so let's let's get on with it and um, let's start with a little quick little collage of the Spencers.
Well, that got me all pumped up now. Um, <laughs> I hope you, I hope you enjoy that. Um, they're a good looking bunch, aren't they? Um, anyways, I wanted to start um, this part of the episode with um, with some ridiculousness, and let's let's sort of I don't know, I guess analyze or or try and give them some common sense or some reasoning to this nonsense. London. This is to mark the 10th anniversary of the Invictus Games. Mm -hmm, yeah. Meghan Markle not coming, by the way, because it's not about her. Um, it's also yeah. unclear uh, the, the... Oh, poor thing. I really think that he's upset, really. And he doesn't know how to manage his feelings about Meghan. Because, you see, these are the same people. When Meghan is with Harry doing anything, they're like, she can't leave him alone. She's a narcissistic person. Oh, look at her just hanging on on him. If I recall, not too long ago, on this same channel or network, it was Angela La Latrine, Lavelle, Latine, La whatever, and, and Angela, you all know who she is, the one who just says things that she invents, I think she said something to the regards that look how Megan always is, is pulling Harry. Poor Harry doesn't know what's going on. She also said that Harry was like a little puppy outside of the window, allegedly, allegedly, you know, implying certain things. Now, for this gem of a so-called journalist, you know, when a person consistently is abused, called names, when stories are invented about that person and it puts that person's life in danger, do you think that person should be coming to a country or a city where you folks have created an atmosphere that is unsafe? So I know you Miss Megan. I know you want her there, darling. But sweetie pie, maybe if you stop doing a little sarcastic little commentary thing that you, you're doing, oh, she's not coming because it's not about her. She's not coming, you jack, because of the environment people like you have created. Grow up. Start telling the truth. Get a real job. King's diary, but essentially he's got a garden party. There seems to be a window when they could be together. And actually, I think they need to get together. I think they certainly need to get together. I really do. Um, but interestingly, they are, are Megan and Mary. Uh, Megan and, and Mary. Mary. Yeah. Okay, so this is what you're going to do. When we start, you're going to pretend to slip up and like call her a name, but like a name that's not like really a name. And then we're going to say, oh my gosh, like <laughs> and we're going to like just study apologize. Grow up. Grow up up listen if they are supposed to meet in other words the king who is the father let me repeat that he is harry's father he is responsible to arrange to meet with harry harry is his son so I think you folks have it backwards, but you know what? Let's practice her name again. And for you, her name is Meghan Markle, Duchess of Sussex, the Countess of Dumbarton, and Baroness Kilkey. Get it right, Moral. Are they not heading off to Nigeria? Are they not heading off to Nigeria afterwards? Right, but so So I the whole Megan thing just completely, it really perturbs me because I think... I am so shocked. I'm actually perturbed that you are... Uh, you're trying to confirm that they're, they're going to Nigeria? Did you not know this? Are you, are you not up to date, sweetheart? I thought you were. Okay, so, so why... Are you bringing Megan again into this? Oh, you're perturbed. Perturbed. By, by, by whom? By Megan? Why, honey, why are you having anxiety or, or feeling concerned? What's the other? Oh, 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 unsettled. Perturbed. Why? About Megan. Is it because 
you had dreams of <laughs> marrying a prince one day, you didn't, darling? Sweetie, sweetie, I thought you were over that. I thought, sweetie, darling, we went to therapy, we talked about it, and, and it was all okay. It's not, is it? Okay, let me see. You're going to say that she is to blame for a lot of things. Should I list them? You know, there's so much out there in terms of what she has done. And I think what she has done has actually disabled the family. Wives should be there to unify families, not to disable them. Or, or partners, she... not oh, wives. Okay. So, this one kind of hit me. And then I, I started thinking. I was like, I don't know what definition you have of a wife and the duties of a wife but according to you one of those duties of a wife or or a partner as, as your colleague tries to be politically correct has the responsibility to mend any rift or any issues with your partners or your husband's family. So the family you're married into, if they have any sort of hmm, problems or issues, your responsibility or part of it is to help them resolve it. That's interesting. And you blaming her for their issues? So the woman who stands up to abuse, the woman who said, okay, this needs to stop. Like, I see the double standards. I see what's happening. And for my own sanity, for my own life, before I don't want to exist anymore, I'm going to just withdraw myself from this situation and go somewhere safe. And I went searching. I kept looking to see where could I find this responsibility. So in modern society, the role and duties of a wife or a partner can vary significantly depending on cultural and personal and societal expectations. However, there's a clear trend towards more egalitarian relationships where duties and responsibilities are shared based on mutual agreement rather than traditional gender roles. There are some common duties that might be shared or divided among partners in today's context. For example, emotional support. Providing emotional support to each other in a fundamental aspect of a modern partnership. This includes listening, understanding, and supporting each other's emotional needs and personal growth. Financial contributions, financial duties, um, can be shared equally, or partners might decide on a different arrangement based on their individual financial situations and preferences. This includes managing household expenses, savings for future goals, and supporting each other through financial ups and downs. Household management. This includes daily chores maintenance of the home, and managing any other domestic responsibilities. Modern couples often strive for a fair distribution of these tasks, sometimes based on their schedules or interest or, you know, aptitudes towards what they may want to do. Parenting. If the couple has children, parenting becomes a significant shared responsibility. This includes providing for the children physical, emotional, educational, and social needs. Decision-making. In modern relationships, both partners typically engage in decision-making process, whether it's related to financial decisions, child rearing, or even planning vacations. This helps ensure that both voices are heard and respected. Health and wellness. Partners often support each other in maintaining physical and mental health. This could involve motivating each other to keep healthy habits, providing care during illnesses, or ensuring a balanced lifestyle. 
And in my quick research, that is what I mostly found. I mean, I'm sure there's other things that a husband and wife will agree to be responsible for or in whatever arrangement they may have between partners to be polit politically correct, right? So that's between the two of them. Or if there are more people involved, then that's between them. But I think the nuance here about you having to resolve the rift between your your partner's family when they're the ones who have created the problem, and not only that, they're the ones who have abused, right? So in other words, let's, let's do that thing. Let's blame the victim. Let's blame the victim for everything and put the entire responsibility to solve the issue on the victim. You know, this is almost becoming like vintage, vintage hatred, because it's the same lines that they use. It's the same tropes that they use. It's so tiring. Get creative. Oh, my goodness. People you might want to follow urge someone who had viewed one hate account or message to follow several others. These 83 accounts were responsible for 70% of the negative content targeted on the couple. One account posted 111,031 messages about them. Bot Sentinel reckons there are 264 single-purpose hate accounts solely targeting Harry and Meghan. To, my, to the innocent bystander, it looks like the whole world hates Harry and Meghan. Um, no, there we are. But this is not just ordinary, spontaneous, or altruistic hatred. It is deliberate and coordinated. It uses social media recommender systems to amplify hatred. Like all clickbait, it uses hatred to entice people to follow a link to an article on another client web page where money is to be made, which is how it knowingly monetizes hatred as shown by the network of YouTube channels that notched up 497 million views and $3.48 million on the back of hateful and inaccurate material about Meghan alone. Three YouTube channels, Yankee Wally, uh, Murky Meg, and according to Taz, had more than 70 million views and earned $494,730, all on the back of hatred of Meghan. The same goes for UK newspapers that fill their online sites with hateful Meghan Mart material. It is becoming their richest clickbait seam, apart perhaps from the sidebar of shame on Mail Online. It drives viewing and earns advertising income, which is why so many British opinion uh, writers pen so much drivel about the couple. Not because the story matters, it doesn't. Not because the writer genuinely cares about it, they don't. But because it makes money. That is not journalism. It's a perversion of journalism. And yet again, it means that the press see other people's lives as commodities to be traded. Oh, you're back. I'm so sorry. Um, just, just give me a few, a few seconds. I'm, I'm trying to send that video to like everyone in the UK media, like everyone, like, I don't know, even the BBC and all the other ones, ITV, Channel 4, everyone, you know, talk TV. Okay. You got it. Everyone, because have they not seen this? Because, or are they willfully ignoring it? Arm propped up to hide his face, Prince Harry was back. Our camera, the only one to film his arrival in the UK, heading into an Invictus event a day earlier than most had expected. Which made the confirmation he won't be seeing his father, who's still having cancer treatment, 
feel peculiar. Harry spokesperson said a meeting unfortunately will not be possible due to His Majesty's full programme. The Duke, of course, is understanding of his father's diary of commitments and various other priorities and hopes to see him soon. We know the King is in London, seen here at Clarence House. Almost on cue, the palace also releasing these photos of him meeting the Prime Minister of Fiji. His military family was always going to be Harry's primary focus this week, 10 years since he launched the Invictus Games for injured service men and women. We will always be here to be able to spread the message, tell the stories, change the perspectives and help as many people as humanly possible because Invictus transcends borders, it transcends politics. It is, it is what it is. There's this, there's this magic within this community. Dominic Reed was involved from the very start and knows Harry well. Prince Harry decided to to leave the UK, to step away from, from royal duties. Has that had any negative impact on Invictus, do you think? No, I don't think it's had a negative impact at all. I think, I mean, it, you know, th there's the business of him being in a different place. So I see him face to face less regularly. We all do. But he does join all of our, our meetings and he does come to all our events. You know, he's, he was in Dusseldorf. Um, he's been at the one year to go events, um, both in Vancouver and in Dusseldorf before that. He's here this week. Some have suggested the recent dramas show they're like any other family. But with Harry's relatives, we are left wondering if it was really royal protocol or the pain of what's been said that stopped another potential reunion. Oh, you got me again. Busy typing away, trying to understand the role of a father in all of this. Because I can, I can talk about the reporting how it started, the middle point, and how it ended. But in all of this, the question that keeps coming up is what's the role of the father? Because even within the reporting, the sort of onus is being placed on Harry. The language that's being used is he will not meet his father. It's not that he doesn't want to meet his father, that his father doesn't want to meet him. And I think that the wise thing that the Sussexes have done is to hire um, media communication representatives to represent them in, in the UK and Europe and in the Americas and across the globe because that statement was, was placed. And that statement is beautiful, beautiful. So, oh, here. I found some stuff here, and it talks about responsibilities of a father from a conservative viewpoint and from a more progressive viewpoint. So let's see what it says. In a more traditional or conservative view, the father is often seen as the head of the family, whose responsibilities include the father is ex expected to act as a mediator in conflicts using his authority and wisdom to guide his children towards reconciliation. He is seen as a moral compass for the family, imparting values and principles that aim to keep the family united and functioning harmoniously, upholding and passing on family traditions and values is seen as crucial. This might involve organizing or insisting on family gatherings. Even in the face of ongoing dispute to reinforce family bonds. Financial and emotional support remains a key responsibility. Even when children are adults, this support is viewed as part of the lifelong commitment a father has to his family. In conservative settings, maintaining respect and authority in the family is important. A father might use his position to enforce rules and behaviors that aim to minimize conflict and promote respect among siblings. In a more modern or progressive context, the role of the father is seen as more flexible and adaptive focusing on emotional support and open communication. 
Instead of imposing solutions, a modern father would encourage open dialogue among siblings, facilitating a safe environment where each child feels heard and valued. Recognizing the individual emotional needs of each child and providing tailored support that respect their autonomy as adults. Striving to remain impartial and fair, avoiding favoritism, which can be a source of contention among siblings. Recognizing when family issues exceed the normal conflicts and encouraging family members to seek mediation or counseling from external professionals. Demonstrating healthy ways of dealing with conflicts and disagreements. Promoting respect for different viewpoints and showing that personal boundaries are important. Accepting that adult children may see their relationship with each other and with their parents differently as they grow older and adapting his role as a father accordingly. I find it absolutely fascinating because I, I, I think I would like to use other words for this, but I'm not going to. It, it, is, it is perhaps sad. It, it, it truly is a sad um, occasion when a father is so emotionally unavailable that he would prefer to ignore his child and not only that to not bring the family together for there to be healing among them instead he puts on this garden party to what compete with his son it, it it is it is very telling how you know this is for injured <laughs> veterans these, 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 these are the for, for for the service members of your country you are the head of state you are the king not even a recognition to say you know, I wish my son all the best or, or um, <sighs> there is so much that can be done. What I'm so proud of is Prince Harry. I'm so proud of this man who maintains his, <sighs> maintains his core, his center. He has done the work, so he knows how to navigate this now. And time after time, he shows us that he is and he's willing to be the bigger person. That he's willing to still come and sit down at your table, even though you've done so much harm to him, to his spouse, and also instigated nonsense against his children. Look, I, I, I don't expect anything to change. I really don't. But it's a sad, sad affair. And for those people that don't see it for what it is, you know, as, as Prince Harry said, I, I, I can't help you. We can't help you. Because it's laid out. Uh, but I know more excuses are going to be created. And the UK media continuously, you know, keeps feeding this, this, this hate. I thought that, you know, Prince Harry was, was not, was persona non grata, right? No one wanted him there. And look at the public that showed up. Then they said, oh, well, it's a bunch of tourist people. Is it though? Well, even if it were, 
He garners interest. Look at how much media from around the world were gathered there. It was important. He arrives and it's a, it, it's an event. He is honest. He's sincere. Look at the way he greets people. With true sincerity in the way he speaks. Getting close to the time where we need to wrap up. So I want you to enjoy the rest of this. Of the images and sounds and so on. Of that special day. And a celebration of Invictus. 10 year anniversary. Now there are varieties of gifts with the same spirit. And there are varieties of services with the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. 10 years is a, is, a, is a real thing. It's, um, it's our birthday uh, at Invictus Games Foundation and we're all very excited and thrilled and you know this really is, some, sometimes you can say, you can look back and go look at what we've done but also given the state of the world there is so much more to do. Sport was the magic that I witnessed and having just come back from Afghanistan myself seeing the wounded, injured and sick and seeing the, the effect this was having on all the families and just the, the, the weight, the load on defense and on the individuals and on the rehabilitation programs, there the just wasn't enough being done. Um, and I don't, and at the same time, not enough celebration and recognition of those sacrifices that were being made. Again, what I'd seen on the battlefield and what I was seeing now were role models. And I just really wanted to do everything that I could to be able to help create a larger platform for more uh, individuals um, and to be able to really celebrate their stories. Well, we've gotten to the end of today's episode. I really hope you enjoyed it. And don't forget to thumbs up uh, subscribe if you are new around here and um, leave a comment. Thank you so much. Hope you enjoyed it. And until we speak again, take care.